Happy December. Welcome to our last Author Connect chat of 2019. I'm Carlin, the sales director at BookPal, a company with a mission to share the transformative power of books with organizations and their people. Today, I am joined by Mo Bunnell, author of The Snowball System, How to Win More Business and Turn Clients into Raving Fans. Welcome, Mo. Hey, thanks, Carlin. I'm excited to be here. We are too. Um, Mo is a speaker, consultant, and the founder and CEO of Bunnell Idea Group, also known as BIG. He helps organizations grow by teaching their highest performers how to bring in more clients and more revenue. Over the course of his career, he's worked in every area of business development and used this knowledge and experience to build the Grow Big business development system resulting from years of testing and peer-reviewed research into why people buy and what makes the buying process happen faster, in greater volume, and with more enjoyment. In the Snowball system, Mo offers powerful and proven tools for business development. Whether you are gregarious or introverted, whether you are a part of a small startup or a massive multinational, Mo's science-based system is effective and efficient and easily adapted into your day-to-day -day work. With the Snowball system, you will not only succeed at growing your business, you'll learn to enjoy doing the activities that drive that growth. You'll be happier and so will your clients. So today, Mo is gonna share some insights from his book, The Snowball System, along with the kinds of things he and his team teach in training classes with high-end organizations. Professional service firms like the Boston Consulting Group, Wilmer Hale and Willis Towers Watson, along with complex service-based companies like Aetna, TransUnion, and Constellation Energy. We will also jump into a Q&A at the end, so please do be sure to submit any questions you have for Mo at any time during the webinar. At the very end, we're gonna give away four signed copies of his book, and we are offering a special secret giveaway at the end of the webinar. I promise you're gonna to wanna to hear this, so please be sure to stick around. We also will be recording today, so we will be sending that out next week to anyone who attended or was not able to attend but signed up. Okay, Mo, it's such a pleasure to have you. Please take it away. Well, thanks, Carlin. I'm, uh, I'm especially excited about the super secret giveaway, so I'm glad you did it up because if you're listening, believe me, we are going to give away a ton of value at the end of this presentation presentation so stick around to the end so what are you going to get today what you're going to get today is a high level overview of the snowball system this is a book it, it, but it's more than a book it's a complete system including downloadable tools over 20 worksheets every single thing somebody needs to know to be great at bringing in business and you heard some of those client names that, that we work with. We've trained over 15,000 people at over 400 organizations. And it was in the, in the building of all that material that I realized at one point several years ago that we've got to make a book out of that. We've got to bring this to the masses. And what you'll get today is sort of an overview of the book. We're going to cover three the three most important things that we see are critical for people to bring in business. We're gonna give those to you today. And it's sort of a, a, a short version of the book in its entirety. So I hope you get a ton of value out of it. And uh, and let's just go ahead and launch in. I think the, the main thing about getting started is you have to understand that quick version of my background to understand where this all came from. So let's do that over a couple of minutes. We'll jump into the deep part of the content. So I grew up in a really small town in Indiana. And by really small, I mean, it had like 80 or 100 people in it. And in that town, we didn't even have a, a four-way stop sign. We had a two-way stop sign. <laughs> and just down the road from the two-way stop sign was this cinder block building, which was a little restaurant next to the tractor pole, as you'd expect, in Northeastern Indiana. You can sort of see it in the background. And inside that restaurant, I learned a lifetime of information from my mom and my dad. My dad was sort of the, if there's no mayor of a town this size, but if there was a mayor, he would have been it. And it was, 
It was more than just he was in between you and the beer, but he was everybody's best friend. He He's the person that would give you the advice you needed, whether you needed, to, needed it or not, or you thought you did or not, in a really caring way. He was always thinking in the best interest of others as opposed to himself, and everybody loved him for it, still do. My mom is a little more like the expert. Um, you can see in this picture, she was a school teacher, and then she would work in the restaurant at night and on weekends. And you can see in that background, even in 1979, improvement starts with I. <laughs> she taught human development. My mom taught in that same room for almost 40 years. So on one hand, I wanted to be my dad, this gregarious, everybody's best friend, always doing the right thing for others. And on the other hand, I wanted to be my mom, the expert, the person that dedicated her life to one thing and become really, really great at it. And I was torn. I sort of felt like at the time you had to do one or the other. So I decided that I wanted to be the world's geekiest profession. That's that's an actuary. If you know what an actuary is, that's that's the people who wanted to be accountants and didn't have the personality. So I, <laughs> I went down the road to Ball State University where they actually had a real degree in actuarial science. So that was sort of leaning towards my mom, but I also wanted to be the crazy person my dad was. So I became the world's possibly first heavy metal actuary. <laughs> uh, I had long hair, I had big earrings. In the daytime, I would study with my actuarial friends. I love deep math. And at nighttime, I was, I was in my fraternity spinning records and do, being a DJ. And it, by the end of my senior year, I was homecoming king. So my, my college uh, advisor said, the odds, <laughs> this is exactly what he said, Mo, the odds of an actuarial science major becoming homecoming king are very low. <laughs> and I thought that was pretty funny. So fast forward through that, I, I really focused on the expertise side. This, the part my mom told me, and by the time I passed that last actuarial exam, the consulting firm I was at moved me to a production role, a role of leading client relationships. And in one instant, I went from the deep technical expert of an actuary to having to bring in business. And I had no training in it. And I was completely scared to death. And I remember this pivotal moment in my life where I went to my boss and said, hey, Michael, where, where's the manual? How, how do you bring in business? How do we do it here? I know we're good at it. And he slapped me on the back and he said, there's no manual, you know, you'll do great. Treat the client right. And that was my training in business development. And, and I was scared to death. So I started reading books. I took people to lunch. I started to cobble together a system that was based on giving and proactiveness and authenticity but keeping my eye on bringing in business at the same time as deepening relationships. And over a period of years, created a Word document that became one page and five and 10 and 50. It became a system that worked and I was able to bring in some of the biggest deals my consulting firm had ever had. About 15 years ago, I left that because I had fallen in love with teaching others business development. And it's what you'll see on the screen here is, this complete training system that we built that covers every last aspect of that. It was almost through the pain of the fear of trying to learn business development in an effective way that made me create a thing for me that I didn't realize other people would want till much later. And that's what this comprehensive system, how it evolved and how it became a book. And the book came out a little over a year ago and it's got a ton of critical acclaim from everything from the number one networking book to Forbes to Adam Grant, Dan Pink, other best-selling authors that loved it. And it's just been a fun ride to take these concepts to the masses. So the first of three big things that, that I wanna cover with you, they're just a little piece of the book, but the, the things you can use right away. First, the first of the three is setting goals. And it's tough to lead with this because a lot of people go, oh yeah, we already set goals, we already do that. But what we found in our research, in our work with all these clients is that most people don't set goals the right way. A lot of times experts set their goals with maybe having a quota or they've got an annual partner plan. They're, they're trying to bring in a certain amount, but they sort of stop there. And we call those lagging indicators. That's really important to do, but it's also important to set leading indicator goals. 
what are the behaviors that someone needs to do week in, week out to bring in the business they need and keep their focus on what they can control so that the results take care of themselves? This picture tells a heck of a story around that that, that I learned in a very deep way. In 2016, I learned that in 2017, the world's first, and this is a mouthful, great grandmasters ultimate Frisbee world championships <laughs> were going to occur in 2017 on the beaches of Portugal. Great grandmasters means age 50 or up in general. And I just was going to turn 50 that year. Really wanted to make a world's team. I had played a lot of ultimate Frisbee at the national level, but not the world's. Started training like crazy. And in the middle of my training, I was lobbying and, and trying out for different teams, trying to make a world roster. And on one play in a practice in late January, I made a defensive play. The disc hit the ground. In ultimate Frisbee, it moves back and forth, just like in soccer, basketball. I grab the disc. I pivot to turn it to try to throw 70 yards down the field to, to one of my teammates who hadn't played defense is now cherry picking on the other side. I just know he's wide open. All I need to do is throw this thing flat as far as I can and we're going to score. And as I turned and came forward, I did not see a defender coming from my blind side who hit my elbow at full extension while I'm throwing it as hard as I can. And it broke my arm 90 degrees ripped the bicep muscle off the bottom. And it was one of the most painful things I've ever dealt with. And I'm three and a half months from Worlds. Had surgery, came out of it, and went to my doctor and said, I've got to make this Worlds team. You told me it's a six to eight month recovery. How can we do it in three and a half? And that experience I had of working with him and the physical therapist who actually traded cell phone numbers, who boiled down this three and a half month plan that they said they're not sure anybody can do, boiled it down to daily regimen, things I can control. And they're calling me to check in on me. And you talk about service. They were, they were engaged on making this goal too. And we did it by breaking down this just outside of our reach goal into very specific daily steps we accomplished more than they thought they could and more than I thought I could. And we actually got made the team and we got fifth in Worlds. The lesson I learned from that, and the research backs it up, is that long-term goals are really important, but we've got to break those down into short-term goals that are 100% in our control. And the research that Dr. Edwin Locke did, possibly the most cited researcher of all time, found that we want to set those goals, both the lagging indicators the year long goals and the short term goals, the daily, the weeklies, we want to set those just outside of what we're comfortable doing. The research shows we want to we want to look at that goal and be a little bit scared. Like, I think I can do it, but I'm not sure. That's exactly what my orthopedic surgeon said is, I think we can do a six to eight month recovery in three and a half months, but I've never seen it before. But let's give it a shot. I'm not sure. That's exactly where you want to set your goals. The other thing that are really important about your short-term goals, those behaviors you, your, you and your team can control, is you want to make them 100% doable by the person, 100% in their control. So you don't want to say, have, uh, have lunch with Sue, a potential client. We want to say, offer lunch with Sue. And the third thing that's really important is to write those so that they're 100% they're helpful. We found that in our experience, writing every single goal, those leading indicator ones, so it's 100% helpful to the other side is really, really powerful. So that's what we want to do with goals is we want to have a long-term goal, but we want to break it down into weekly sprints that are 100% in our control and 100% helpful. The second of our three things, this research is so interesting. Dr. Teresa Mobley out of, out of Harvard, found that the most successful people and the happiest, I thought that was so interesting, and the happiest are folks that celebrate incremental progress. Now, I, told, I chose this picture of my wife taking a photo of, of my younger daughter and, and nephew I love so much while we're backpacking. Every year we backpack deep into the Cahuta Wilderness in North Georgia. 
And when I'm backpacking, I just celebrate the journey. I'm not worried about the destination. I don't care if we're halfway or a third or 72% or whatever. I just enjoy each step of the way. And it's that mindset that we want to have when we're developing uh, business, when we're growing. And the way this is done very practically is to have some type, and this is really important, some type of weekly ritual where you recap what you did in the last week that was based on the goals that you set that were 100% in your control, 100% helpful, and you set your goals for the upcoming week. It's super important to do that weekly because we found our minds think in weeks. Our minds don't think in terms of every other Tuesday or even the first of the month. We know what a Monday feels like. We know what a Friday feels like, and we're doing, and we we can't unfeel that. So we want to tap into that habit, that feeling. And the way I do this is every week from four o'clock to to five on Friday. I I take a little longer to do this than it needed. It takes about 15 minutes. I do it an hour because I do some other things too. I recap the prior week. I do it in an app on my phone called Day One, and I type in the stuff I've got done. Then I measure, if I had three important things I wanted to do the prior week, I measure how many of those did I get done, zero, one, two, or three. Happy if it's three, not so much if it's one. And then I pick my things the next week. And that weekly ritual of doing that keeps me focused. And then I do the celebrate part that's meaningful to me is I just attach a few photos of fun things that happened that week. And that trains my brain to love that rich ritual and then I'd rinse and repeat every other week. I haven't missed a week in 223 weeks. I certainly don't wanna miss one now. And what our clients say is it takes three, four, five, six weeks to get in this routine, but once they're in it, they can't live without it. It declares what victory is for the next week for them. And then if they get their say three out of three things done, they feel great about it as opposed to the distraction, worry, worry, worrisome world of, oh, I still got 32 emails in my inbox, or I got all these to-dos I didn't do. If we hit our top three things each week, week in and week out, that's like 150 high priority tasks we're doing a year. And that's what victory is. Last piece of content, build psychological momentum. I chose this picture because this is my older daughter helping her team win a, a state championship in cross country. Horrible day, practically hurricane the day before, but Gabby attacked that race where she had negative splits throughout the race. She led, she ran each mile in her 5K race, 3.1 miles. She ran each mile faster than the one before. You can see the mud on her legs. You can even see me in the upper left with the green shirt running with my my uh, my phone in my hand videotaping. I was so excited. I ran about two miles while she ran 3.1, trying to see her on so many times in the race. And this is the kind of feeling that we want to have when we're doing business development. The, the research here, Seppo Isohola has done the most interesting research on this that I've seen out of Virginia. And what he has studied in, in high performing sports teams is that you build psychological momentum by setting initial goals super low and building them up over time. So if we wanted to do three high priority things a week from our last piece of content, we really wanna get that over time. We might just choose one in the first week set the bar so low we can step over it and then build up over time. If we want to speak at 12 conferences next year, we might start with just one in the first quarter. If we wanted to offer one give to get, a piece of our methodology, which is where you, you offer like a one hour intensive session that's on your dime to expose somebody to, to your big brain and the kind of expertise you bring. If we wanted to offer one of those a week next year, maybe we just start with trying to get one a month in the first couple months. We set the initial bar so low we can step over it and we build up over time. And that's so important because what a lot of people do in business is they tend to set a goal and wanna rush out and do the full thing right away. We actually wanna get there over time, but we wanna ramp up, have early successes. And that actually we found is much more successful and tied to long-term success than if we try to do, if we try to do everything at once versus when we try to ramp up, much more effective. So if we, if we sort of summarize those things, the big thing that we want to do is set those goals. We want, the lock research tells us we want to set them just out of our reach. 
We don't want to just set annual goals, which most people do now. They've got a quota, they've got an annual partner plan. We want to break those down into weekly activities that are 100% in our control. And then we have weekly sprints where we're celebrating incremental progress. We've got some kind of weekly ritual that we perform week in and week out. Might be Monday morning, Sunday night, Friday afternoon, like I do at any time, but we do it every week without fail. And we're going to review the prior week's goals. We're going to look at the next, and we're going to keep the focus on the high priority, big impact work we can do, as opposed to, say, answering a lot of emails. And then we're going to set the initial goals super low, set that bar so low we can step over in the beginning, and we're going to build up over time until this new habit is rolling like a flywheel or like a snowball going downhill. So, Carlin, why don't I why don't I come up for air there and and just summarize by saying this whole thing is how you think big, you start small and you scale up over time. And that's what we found makes people the most successful. Thank you so much, Mo. I love this, um, this slide. I feel like this is, as you said, kind of just like the essence of what people really need to do to start um, implementing this in their own lives. Um, I guess my question initially, just looking at this slide too, is it best to implement this kind of that weekly ritual, that review for yourself, as well as your team and department and organization? Or is it more, I mean, I guess, what's the first best approach, depending on maybe the size of your company or, you know, what your BD role is in the company? Yeah, so it can work. It's a great question. It can work either way. If individual, you do it pretty much like I talked about, where you want to use an app or a journal or something to keep track of this. But like there's a big healthcare company that we're working with where we're going to roll this out to hundreds of their leaders in January. And what we're doing there is the, the measure we pick that's 100% helpful, 100% in everybody's control is picking three things a week that they're going to focus on doing. And it's in that dialogue the manager has with the frontline person of they submit their three things and then they either agree or tweak or they change things. It's that dialogue between the manager and the person that they're they're coaching and helping get even better that they start to get into, are those the right three things? How to do them? How, as the leader is coach, how can they be helpful to the person to execute on those? And that's gonna bring up the talent so much faster than if they're each just independently working. So whether it's done as an individual, sort of the example I gave, or it's done at scale, it's that same routine matters and it gets the dialogue more like a high performing sports team would prepare for a game, debrief the game. It pulls that kind of context into a business world where you can have that happen week in and week out. And what we see happen is the talent of the organization rises faster, the relationships get tighter between person and their, and their leader, their boss, and they're all focused on higher value things as opposed to the leader just popping in and doing the doing their subordinates work for them when needed, sort of a, a super salesperson or a super account manager. This helps bring up the talent better and in a way that creates sort of a winning team mentality. Does that help? Very helpful. Yeah, I love the sports analogy because I feel like all of us want to come to the table thinking about, okay, here are my priorities and then have that conversation with our manager or our team and department and say, do you agree? Do you disagree? Where else should my focus be so that we can, as a team, um, you know, on, on and off the field, if you will, <laughs> achieve the goals of the organization? You That's really it. helpful. And that psychological momentum, what we see with our clients is they start to love the process because they know exactly where they stand with their leader. The leader know exactly what they're focused on, as opposed to that other way where a lot of organizations can fall in the trap of you don't really get feedback, but once a year, you know, at your annual performance review yes. and you're a little bit fearful of it the whole time like this this breaks that down into little sprints on a weekly basis that are really small might take only 10 minutes to have that dialogue once a week but boy that is meaningful time absolutely i couldn't agree more so i have another question just because it is something that i feel like i struggle with how do you avoid the burnout of the prospect prospecting and BD space in general, you know, when you feel like you have hundreds or even thousands of opportunities, clients, prospects, you know, at various levels, I guess, what, what is kind of your best answer? And I'm sure you've been asked this many times. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's pulling back. There's so much more in the book than we can cover in this, in a quick half hour. But one of the things is focusing on winning um, because it's hard. It's easy to focus on the, 
the outreach that you gave after you met somebody at a conference and they don't reply and then you feel like a failure. <laughs> but if you keep focusing on doing the things that you can do that are in your control and keep progressing and keep moving things forward, focusing on the, the win, in other words, not is not necessarily bringing in the big deal, which is, of course, everybody celebrates that and we should, but the win is the incremental progress each week and keep focusing on the progress you make versus the person that hasn't replied back or whatever else you want that's out of your control. And if you just keep the focus on doing the right things in and week in and week out and sort of ring the bell, so to speak, a lot of our clients actually have bells they ring, ring the bell when you offer the lunch, have the bell, ring the bell when you talk about money in person with clients when it was uncomfortable before, ring the bell when you ask for feedback from procurement when you're afraid to ask them because you think they're, they kick puppies on the weekends and you're fearful of them. It's like ringing the bell on the things you can control gets your brain trained to love those pieces. And if you do that over and over again, you'll do the high priority things. So Carlin, to your point, that's something that, that's part of the winning team culture a, a client of ours, our organization can have when they start focusing not just on the big deals one, which can make us think, oh, only Jane's good at business development, but when we focus on skill development and the little incremental things in our control that are happening, that's when we get more of those and people start winning more. That is so powerful. We actually have a bell here at BookPal and we do ring it um, frequently, but it is mainly sales oriented. And I love the idea of turning that more into, hey, we got a client to agree to take, you know, have a lunch with us. We yep. um, are working better as a team. We're being more efficient on a certain process. So we should be looking for opportunities to celebrate other wins that are not clearly and solely revenue related. You got it. One of our clients called it focusing on progress, not perfection. So you strive for perfection, but you ring the bell on progress. And then everybody, you just, it's amazing how much more of a good feeling you have around the office when that bell's ringing all the time. Fantastic. Um, we did get a question from David and he said, how do you avoid burnout when the preparation for an initial meeting and presentation with a prospective client takes a tremendous amount of time and the probability of actually landing the client is really small? David, great question. So one of the things I wanted to chat about today, but it's in the book, is then what we call dynamic meeting prep is one to full, almost a full chapter. And another one is on targeting, like focusing on building your specific criteria that you that you think is a perfect fit for you and your organization so the 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 targeting focused on who should we try to land a meeting with and there's a lead gen chapter too on how do we get in front of them in a way that we're adding so much value they want to bend their schedule to meet with us which brings up your your rates of success and then dynamic meeting prep how do we prepare for that meeting and a lot of what we see with our clients is before they have really tried and true set systems for that, it can take a lot longer than needed because as a team prepares for a meeting, David, maybe this resonates with you, you spend most of your time talking about how we're gonna prepare for the meeting instead of actually preparing for the meeting. But when everybody's on the same page and they know the exact six steps of dynamic meeting prep, they walk in and they're ready to go. They know that they're gonna cover the goal, what's the frame, You know, what are the questions they're gonna ask us, what questions we ask them, and so on. And those are part of the six steps. And when there's a common vernacular or playbook for these things, they actually speed up significantly and then you can handle more of them. So I guess that was a bit long-winded way of saying, if you've got, and this is all in Snowball system, so grab it, but if you've got a common playbook for those things that happen over and over again, targeting lead gen, dynamic meeting prep, then they actually happen to a much faster time frame, and then you get much more efficient and then that helps with the burnout because it doesn't take as long to do the thing. That's a great answer and I've definitely been there where I've spent way too much time preparing and maybe not enough time thinking about the outcome <laughs> that I'm hoping for or that they're hoping for. So great advice. You got um, it. I think we have time for maybe one more question. And you talk about obviously how, you know, this is a quote, I love it. Raving fans are your fastest path to new clients through referrals, which is so true. Um, I see it in my daily work as well. What would you say is the best way to encourage or ask for referrals without potentially sounding cheesy? 
Yeah. Well, we've got a, a quick little four-step process in the in the book that covers that, but I'll I'll leave it with this: is that people that already love you, we've got a seven-step process to from somebody we haven't met yet all the way to raving fan, meaning we can look at their behavior and know where they're at on the seven steps. Raving fan is somebody that's already provided a, a referral proactively. They love you so much they're telling others about you. And the fastest way to get from one step to the next in those is to ask for it. Once you get out to the last two steps, what we call trusted advisor and raving fan, those people already love you so much that they actually want to provide referrals. So the, the mindset, the one thing I want to cover on this one is a lot of our clients before they go through a class or read the book is they think they're putting their clients out by asking for a referral. I want you to flip that. If you've added so much value in somebody's life that they're already in a trusted advisor kind of relationship or they've already asked, for, they've already become a raving fan, we're actually letting them down when we don't ask for it because we're denying them the feeling of being helpful, which we all want as human beings. So the, so the, the quicker version is the answers in the book, but if we do one thing, I want people to make the mind shift, mindset shift, which is by after somebody loves you to a certain level, we're letting them down if we don't ask for the referral. Carlin, does that help? Very helpful. I love that way of thinking too, um, and agree that once you feel like you have that trusted advisor or raving fan, that if you're not allowing them to help you and have that feeling of help um, by introducing you to someone else, it's really you're cheating them out of it. So very exactly. helpful. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, seriously, we can't thank you enough, Mo. We really, really appreciate your time today. And to everyone here, um, just a couple of reminders and then some announcements. We will be sending out a recording of the webinar next week. We, so just we, can't rem we can't forget the secret word too. So oh, keep we're not going to forget. Don't, don't worry. We're not for we will not forget that. Um, so stay tuned for that. And also a reminder that you can purchase the book um, on our site at book-pal.com backslash snowball. Um, you can also email me at k-a-r-l-y-n at book-pal.com. Um, so yes, as a reminder, we do have the special giveaway offer and I am going to let Mo go a little bit more into it, but in general, Mo has offered a very generous um, offer for anyone who is going to order 50 or more copies of the Snowball system for their organization. Um, that person will receive a special webinar from Mo for their entire organization, which is a $12,500 value. You just need to mention the secret or special word um, in an email to me, which is Snowball. And I will let Mo go into a little bit more detail. Well, we 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 were struggling with what secret word. I sort of liked Carlin, but Carlin convinced me that the secret word should be snowball. <laughs> but <laughs> um, so a webinar, we can do anything for you. So the snowball system, the beauty of it is it's comprehensive. So we're thinking a webinar up to an hour. We can do whatever you want. I can have a dialogue with you after you after you buy the books on you could tell me any topic, any skill you want your folks to get better at, and then I can, I'll know the chapter and the content that we could cover to help with that. So you could buy the 50 plus books, send them around to your team, and then we could either do a webinar to kick things off or after they read it, a lot of clients have done this, after they read the whole book, we can either give a summary of the entire book or we can do a deep dive on one specific skill area that you'd like people to be better at and we can cover that over an hour and we can tailor it just for your organization so we're using the vernacular and the words and the priorities that you want us to cover basically like a bunch of free training for the price of price of 50 books and we normally charge twelve thousand five hundred dollars for that so it is a heck of an offer and we'd love to offer that to anybody that works for or that orders the books through bookbound because we're raving fans of BookPal. Oh, thank you so much, Mo. Truly, um, your book is so helpful, such actionable um, oriented items that we can all take away. So anyone listening, be sure to take him up on this very generous and awesome offer. Um, I also want to take a moment to announce our winners of these four signed copies. So we will be emailing you for your address, um, Karen Delaney, Tony Wohler, Christian Brito, and Esther Derby. So congratulations on winning a signed copy of Mo's book. 
a very, very helpful resource. Um, and I just want to remind everyone that we will be back in January. On January 7th, we'll be sitting down with Michelle Tillis Letterman, author of The Connector's Advantage. Um, Mo, we cannot thank you enough for your time. It was so helpful. And I cannot thank you enough for writing this book because it's an incredible resource. Thank you, Carla. It's been a joy to work with you on all the stuff we've done together. Thank you. All right. Bye, everyone.